Well, there are uh, some people I can introduce uh, as our speaker, and uh, with more emotion than um, maybe with others. I, I'm always glad for whoever God brings to the college here. But I, uh, I've been doing this college thing now for, gosh, almost 20 years. I uh, spent seven years at Hope College, and uh, sitting over there uh, in Dimnant Chapel, where I uh, led the chapel ministry for seven years, was uh, a guy named Kevin DeYoung. And uh, it's been a while. And, and you know, I, I, it, it, when you preach, uh, Jesus said it's like a sower sort of throwing the seed out, and you just don't know what kind of ground it's falling on. And I believe that every time uh, we gather here for chapel, I don't know what God's doing in your life, but I know God's at work. And uh, it's just really sweet sometimes to see, and again, I'm not the only one who was sowing seed in Kevin's life, uh, to see what God has done with someone that I just knew as a student uh, back in the 90s at Hope College. Uh, Kevin is a pastor of University Reformed Church. It's uh, virtually on the campus of Michigan State University. Uh, he's written some wonderful books. Um, a book on the mission of the church, which I highly recommend. A book that I give away is whenever I get a chance. is uh, It's on knowing the will of God. And great title. It's just do something. And uh, it's, it's just good biblical common sense. Uh, a book we're studying as a church now, Community Church, is The Whole in uh, Your Holiness. And uh, if a, a book on holiness can be lighthearted as well as bracing, well, Kevin's pulled that off. Uh, this man can write, uh, he can preach, uh, but, I'm, but I'm just glad to have him here because I trust him so much with, uh, with the integrity of his life and his thought and his preparation. So Kevin, um, I got through it without even crying, but I'm so glad you're here. Let's welcome Kevin DeYoung uh, to our chapel here. It's a real joy to be with you again. Uh, I was here uh, a, f a few years ago, and uh, it's a privilege to be here. And w whenever I get to preach God's Word, it's a great privilege. Uh, I have a special heart for college students. Uh, and one of the reasons is uh, right along with what Ben was saying, it's, it's such a key time in your life, and there is such an opportunity that God gives to have time to reflect, to study, to think, to pray, to find out what you really believe, who you really are, what it really means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. And when I look back at my life, lo, these many years ago, and I see people who have made a marked impact on who I am, my parents and other pastors and friends, but Certainly on that journey is, is Ben Patterson. So I love to be here, to be with all of you and also to see my friend and a, a man whose preaching was greatly influential in my life and so many times leaving that chapel feeling as Wesley might have said, my heart strangely warmed. And speaking of warmth, I thought there would be more of it coming here. You know, when I'm from Michigan, Maybe some of you have heard of Michigan. We, we live in igloos, we have polar bears, we pretty much just skate to work on frozen rivers 10 months out of the year. So I, I, you know, when, when anybody has a chance to go to Santa Barbara, I mean, it just, it just sounds so. Santa Barbara, <laughs> East Lansing, Michigan. I mean, it's just, you don't, so I was excited, and, and, uh, and yes, I did walk out yesterday from my hotel and went on a run and, and saw the ocean there. It's so salty, though, the water here, oh, so salty. But I looked on my phone this morning, and as I was seeing you know, what the weather was here, and it was supposed to be a high of 65, cloudy chance of rain, I looked at Lansing, Michigan, completely sunny, 72 degrees. You really ought to check it out sometime. It's not that bad. I want to talk to you this morning about two difficult realities you must accept, you must embrace, if you are to live as faithful Christians in our day and really in any day. 
Two difficult realities you must embrace if you are to live as faithful Christians in the world. Number one, you will have enemies. And number two, you must love those enemies. Jesus plainly taught both these things. Matthew 5, 43 through 45 of the Sermon on the Mount, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I say to you, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. Jesus clearly taught you must love your enemies. And he also taught clearly that you will have enemies. Matthew 10, 21 and 22, brother will deliver brother over to death and the father, his child and children will rise against parents and have them put to death and you will be hated by all for my name's sake, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. Not maybe, but you will be hated. Accepting either one of these truths is challenging, but to accept and to embrace both of them requires a work of the Holy Spirit through the Word of God. Some people can accept that they will have enemies in this life, and maybe this is some of you by dint of personality or your upbringing or your church experience, and you understand, yes, the world may hate you, and you prepare for the worst, and you're ready for battle, and you know that the world is not your home, and you expect that people will not like all of your Christian beliefs. And in fact, you feel some confirmation that you're on the right track when you face much opposition. You are prepared for enemies. But that may not be a work of the Spirit. May that just may be your personality. Your sort of model of ministry is Jesus in the temple. And whenever you get an opportunity, say, we have a Jesus in the temple. Remember, he whipped people, so Jesus in the temple. And you aren't particularly interested in loving your enemies. You're always in battle mode and not keen to forgive or to pray. And you have a lot of courage and not a lot of compassion. On the other hand, some people are just the opposite. And that may be you because of your personality or upbringing or church and you believe in love with all your heart and you know you must turn the other cheek and you care deeply for the feelings and the hurts of others and you see a world out there, not a world that needs to be rebuked, but a world that needs to be embraced and you want people to get along. You want your whole life to be about minimizing conflict and finding common ground and you are fully prepared to show people the love of Christ. But consider, do you have a very robust view of the love of Christ. Many people, and especially the young, equate love with unconditional affirmation. And you are always in bridge building mode, no stomach to ever upset someone, and you have a great deal of compassion, but no courage. And you have forgotten that in Revelation, among those who are numbered outside of the gates of heaven, are the cowardly. We need both. If you are going to be a faithful Christian in a fallen world, you must be prepared to be hated, to have enemies, and to love those enemies, even to the point of death. I want to read to you from Acts chapter 7. If you have a Bible or you have one on some electronic device near you, and I can't imagine that anyone here doesn't have a phone. You might want to turn there because after all, no one speaking from this pulpit has ever been inspired, but this book is. And so it's best to pay attention to this book. Acts chapter 7, verses 54 through 60 this is after Stephen has delivered his famous speech before the Sanhedrin, and he has rebuked them as insolent, stiff-necked, stubborn-hearted people, and now we get their tragic response. Verse 54, now when they heard these things, they were enraged, and they ground their teeth at him. 
But he, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God, and he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened, and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and rushed together at him. Then they cast him out of the city and stoned him, and the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. And as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. If we are going to be faithful Christians in a fallen world, we must be prepared to have enemies and to love those enemies, to do both. We see both in the martyrdom of Stephen. First, we see enemies. I mean, they hated Stephen. I mean, they really hated. Not the sort of, you know, your friend gets mad. I hate you, which means, you know, I can't believe you left that out in the bathroom and I'm so mad that I'm going to go tell all my other friends and then by tonight we'll cry and we'll hug about it. (laughs) No, really hate. And now not just the elites or the Jewish officials, but for the first time in Acts, now the masses, the people are enraged. In Greek it says, diapriento tais cardiais auton. They ripped the their hearts, their cardias, they were sawn in two in the innermost being. It's if their hearts were exploding with rage, and so they ground their teeth at him. It may seem strange to us. We don't typically do that when we're mad, just, yeah, it doesn't convey the same thing, but this was very typical in the ancient world, and especially in the Jewish mindset. You you clench your teeth, you grind your teeth. It is an expression of anger. We might say you, your jaw is clenched with furious rage. Now, why did they hate him? You might think they hated Stephen because he called them names. And so long as we don't call people names, people won't hate us. But when you think about it, the reasons for hating Stephen are not so different from the reasons that people might hate you, or me, or anyone following Christ. Yes, this was a remarkable situation, the first martyr in the history of the church, but when you look underneath it, it's not all that unusual. Why did they hate him? Well, first, because he spoke strongly. He spoke strongly. Look at uh, verses 51 and 52, the end of his sermon. You stiff-necked people. Okay, here's his application coming home in this sermon. Uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit. As your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one whom you have now betrayed and murdered, you who received the law as delivered by angels and did not keep it. We have a hard time with people who speak strongly. Maybe that's like why we always are like talking like, like, I don't know, like, like this. Like I'm not sure like what I'm really saying or like if I have a strong opinion because I like, I don't want to, you know, like hurt anyone's feelings. The reaction might have been different if Stephen had finished by saying like, like many of us would have, maybe I would have been tempted you get to the end of his sermon and say, now, in conclusion, listen, uh, folks, I'm, I, I could be wrong about this. This is just one man's opinion. Um, I, I know there are many ways of seeing this, but it feels to me, just to me, I'm just telling you what it, what it, what it feels like to me. I'm just doing some reflexive listening. I'm just saying it feels to me that you may have some growth edges, some area to improve in this whole concept of your response to God, uh, Maybe. That's how the world wants Christians to speak. No convictions, just feelings. Not truth, just thoughts. And you understand there's certainly a time 
or you may be silent, a time where you, you may have to speak with so many qualifications, but then there is a time when you should not, and this was one of those times. He spoke boldly, and they did not like it. Remember, what did they marvel at in Jesus' teaching? They say, wow, Jesus, he, he's not like the scribes and Pharisees because he's really funny. No, because he's really so smart, because he really is a good storyteller. That's not what they said. They marveled because unlike the scribes and the Pharisees, he spoke as one who had authority. This is why the world does not like preaching. They don't like preaching because it dares to say, hear ye, hear ye, a word from Almighty God. Now, it only has authority insofar as it conforms to this word. He spoke strongly and they did not like it. They hated him for it. Second, we see they hated him because he spoke of their sin. His whole sermon was to look at their history so marked with rebellion from Joseph and the prophets and Moses to see how they were stiff-necked and hard of hearing, always resisting the Holy Spirit. That's who they had been. That's what they were. And that's what he said. He told them to their face, you've sinned. Do you know why most people don't follow the Lord Jesus? Yes, there are sometimes existential kind of angst and the problem of evil and personal pain. Don't discount that. There are sometimes people have very legitimate intellectual questions. But often at the very root of it, it is simply this. We love sin more than we love Christ. And you can read it through the history of philosophy and a number of people who quite plainly came up with very non-Christian ideas in order that it might justify how they wanted to live. I can't remember if it was Julian Huxley or Aldous Huxley, but one of those who was very plain about his motivation for his uh, sexual ethic and rejecting God was simply because they wanted to do what they wanted to do. People don't like to be, have their sin pointed out. I don't. I hate it when I have, you know, my wife or a friend or somebody sit down and, Kevin, I just, I wanted to talk to you about something. Oh, no. You know, nobody ever starts that. I wanted to talk to you about something. I really wanted to take you out for dinner. No, no, no. That's not how those talks go. There's been something I've been meaning to say. You're awesome. It doesn't happen like that. You just brace yourself because they're going to point something out. You don't want to hear about sin. People don't want to hear about sin. Now, I understand sometimes people hate Christians because we're rude or mean or inconsiderate, and wherever it's true, let's repent. But it's also true that on certain issues and in certain hearts, it does not matter how soft you are, how many caveats you make, how much affirmation you put around the edges. As soon as you call out sin, people will be enraged. And it will be true with sexual ethics in our day. You can have a lifetime of good deeds to show for yourself, and you can give 10,000 caveats and 100 affirmations, and when you get to the point where you say, and this behavior is sin according to the Word of God, some will be enraged. They did not like Stephen because he spoke strongly, he spoke of sin, and he spoke of his Savior. Look, they hated Stephen because he called out their sin, but they killed him because he called on the Son of Man. You see this in verses 56 and following. It's after he claims to see the Son of Man at the right hand of God that they cry with a loud voice, stop their ears, and rush together to kill him. If he had simply affirmed Jesus as a prophet or a miracle worker or as a wonderful man, but no, he claims to see him at the right hand of God the Father, at the place of power and privilege. And they don't think that Jesus has this unique role 
They would have been happy perhaps, maybe not happy, but would have given him a pass if he had just, you know, affirmed some nice things about Jesus. But to see Jesus as the unique, exalted Son of God and Son of Man was too much for them. It is the uniqueness of Christ and His identity that drove them to murder. You may have heard people say before, well, they killed Jesus because He was so inclusive and so tolerant and so loving to the least of these. But I challenge you to to read the Gospels and you will find that yes, they were often perturbed that that He was a friend of tax collectors and sinners, no doubt. But you can read over and over that they killed him because he dared to make himself equal with God. It was his identification as the divine Son of God and the chosen long-awaited Messiah that drove them to murderous rage. And so it was with Stephen. They hated him so much they put him to death. Even though their law should not have allowed it, and even though they did not have under Roman jurisdiction the rights of capital punishment, so here they are claiming that this man is against the law, and then they go and they break the law to kill him. Do not be surprised when people who are filled with hatred and rage are not really too terribly concerned with consistency. Their hearts were hard. They plugged them up. They stopped them up. They did not want to hear. Don't you remember Jesus over and over? (laughs) Let he who has ears, let him hear. Because you can speak and you can speak and you can have sermon after you can have sermon and Bible study upon Bible study and sometimes you just don't have ears or you have them and you've stopped them up. And God must sovereignly open them. They didn't have ears to hear with Stephen, absolutely enraged. But I want you to see how Stephen loved his enemies. Because if we are to be faithful, we must must affirm, like Stephen, we will have those who hate us, and we must, like Stephen, learn to love those who do. We know he loved his enemies because he prayed for them. And because of what he prayed for them, in verse 60, falling to his knees in his last breath, crying out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. It's not to say that he was happy with what was happening or he didn't want justice. No. We may struggle to forget. We may struggle to forgive. We may never actually forget some injustices. But this is an extreme act of love that he would pray for their well-being, for their spiritual good. I'm reminded of this great line D.A. Carson, New Testament scholar, wrote about his dad who was a pastor. He said, I never heard him put anybody down except on his prayer lists. (laughs) How did Stephen love like this? How, How do you have stones coming upon you, the end of your life, and what comes out of your mouth in your dying moment is forgive them. How does that happen? Many people want this kind of love. Our world affirms this kind of love. Yes, we want this forgiving love. We wax eloquent about it, but here's the mistake we make. We think we can have, get to that love without all of the theological power that makes it possible. And so people say, I just want to be a better person, and I'm interested in Christianity that I might be uh, a, a better husband or father or student, but Christianity doesn't work like that. You can't just skip around all the truth and just get to becoming a better person. Everything about who we are as Christians is wrapped up in our theology of God and Christ and sin and salvation, and we see it here with Stephen. Let me just quickly give you three reasons. I give you three reasons why they hated him, three reasons why he loved his enemies. How could he love his enemies in the midst of such rank persecution? First, because he knew God would vindicate him. You see, he uses this language, son of man. 
Now, you may think, oh, yes, yeah, Son of Man. God, Christ is the Son of God. He's divine, and He's the Son of Man, which means He's human. But that's not what the term Son of Man means in Acts or in the Gospels. Like, this is one of the very rare occasions that this term is used outside of the Gospels where Jesus uses it to describe Himself. It is actually a divine term that goes back to the vision of Daniel in Daniel chapter 7, one like a son of man came and was presented before the Ancient of Days. And we see this picture of God the Father and then God the Son, also a divine being. So, son of man is divine language. At His trial, Jesus declared to the high priest, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of God, coming on the clouds. This title spoke of the power of the Messiah, His unique authority to judge the living and the dead. And so, when, when Stephen claims to see Christ as the Son of Man on the throne, it is an expression of his confidence that Christ will vindicate him from his enemies. Listen, you will never be able to love your enemies unless you have a God of justice. Now, this sounds paradoxical, but it is absolutely true and biblical. Forgiveness is to forego the justice you deserve. Forgiveness is not saying, well, no big deal. No, it is a big deal when people sin against you. It's, it's, a, it's a tear in the co cosmic fabric of the universe. You don't just say, oh, no big deal. God doesn't forgive us by just waving His hand in some sort of legal fiction and say, you know what, I always said sin was a big deal, but today, eh, never mind, forget about it. No. <laughs> it is only by the administration of justice that this justice can be satisfied. It's only when you have a God of justice that you can be the most incredibly, extravagantly loving and forgiving person. Let me show you what I mean. 1 Peter 2. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example, so that you might follow in His steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in His mouth. When Christ was reviled, He did not revile in return. When He suffered, He did not threaten, but continued entrusting Himself to Him who judges justly. Do you see the connection? How did Christ not revile when reviled? How did He not turn evil for evil? How did He not threaten when He suffered? Peter tells us, because He entrusted Himself to the one who judges justly. In other words, it was the belief and the sure knowledge Christ had that though you may persecute me, though you may beat me, though you may crucify me, you are not the ultimate judge. And there is one who will judge justly. And so, this was Stephen's confidence in the Son of Man, that they could kill him here, they could hate him in this moment, but it wasn't ultimately their judgment that mattered. Until we understand what, what, how the world judges us, Consider it as nothing. Despise it. Despise the shame. That's what Jesus did. You consider it as, as insignificant, as irrelevant, because it is not ultimately those who will judge you, but there is one who will judge justly. And Stephen knew he will vindicate me on the last day. Until you have a strong God with edges and justice, you will not fully be able to be a people of softness and gentleness and love and forgiveness. He knew that God would vindicate him. Second, he knew God was glorious. We see him gazing into heaven. It says earlier, he had a face like an angel. He saw something in heaven that was stunning to him. Now, we can't be sure, but I imagine one of the reasons Stephen prayed what he did is because he saw what the crowds and the Sanhedrin were missing. He saw a glorious God. 
And maybe we do not pray for our enemies and we do not love our enemies. Maybe we do not want what is best for our enemies because we have not really seen and tasted how good it is. I think Stephen, like a face as an angel gazing into heaven and seeing the Son of Man, seeing the glorious ones, seeing the angelic heavenly host, knew, oh Lord, I don't want these people to miss what I'm seeing. If only they could see what I see. So he loved his enemies and wanted what is best for them because he knew how good and sweet and beautiful and true and glorious it was. And finally, he knew God's son was not to be trifled with. That's why he loved. That's why he prayed. Do you notice something peculiar in verses 55 and 56? All throughout the the Gospels, Jesus speaks of the Son of Man seated at the right hand of God. We confess in the Apostles' Creed, the third day rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven where he sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. Sitting, and yet in verse 55 and verse 56 we see Jesus standing at the right hand. It's too deliberate and too peculiar to just be coincidence. Why is Jesus standing instead of sitting? Well, the commentaries that I read uh, are all basically saying the same thing, and it makes sense to me, that Jesus is rising to receive Stephen's testimony and to be his advocate. He is standing to be his intercessor, to pray and to receive his prayers and to come to his defense. It is rising much as the attorney would rise after his Witness has been falsely accused, and then he stands as an advocate ready to defend, to receive, to correct. And so Christ, before the throne of God above, where we have a perfect plea, is standing here that he might come to Stephen's defense And you and I must surely realize that when we have to stand before this Christ, we will want Him to be our advocate. He is not a Christ to be trifled with. We want Him to stand to receive us not to stand that he might, like these persecutors of Stephen, reject us. Jesus himself says in Revelation, behold, I am coming soon, bringing my recompense with me to repay everyone for what he has done. I don't care how funny you are, how cynical you are. We will not be able to just sort of laugh and chuckle and snark our way through this vision and this encounter with the risen and standing Christ. He will be at that moment our greatest friend and savior and advocate or our dread judge. Friends, this is the dividing line. It would divide Judaism and Christianity at this moment and it has always been the dividing line with us still today. What do you think of Jesus? You must be prepared Though people may speak of how much they don't like the church or the word or this particular doctrine or that, underneath it all, it is Jesus, His church, His word, His truth, the dividing line that strikes through every human heart and every civilization and every time and day and age. We must be prepared. People will hate what you find precious, 
They will consider debased what you deemed exalted. They will think lame what you think lovely. We are not ready to be Christians until we are prepared that some people will despise what we delight in. And so Stephen calls on Christ. You notice the difference between he, everything is like Christ on the cross except Christ calls Father and Stephen calls Lord Jesus. Even there in his last moment, it is to show where this dividing line falls. And if you are on the wrong side of it, there's hope for you because there is one here, Saul, who will be an answer to Stephen's prayer. God can change us that we might love the truth, that we might love our enemies, and that we might love the one who is all love and truth and lay down his life for his enemies. If you are to be faithful in this day, you need great compassion, you need great courage, and above all, we need this great Christ. Let's pray. Father, time is short, our lives are busy, there's one more message among hundreds and dozens and thousands, but be pleased to do a work by your Spirit through your word, make this generation, Lord, full of compassion and full of courage that we might be faithful to Christ. We pray in his name, amen. You are dismissed.